Hello, History 17B, Spring Quarter 2024, and welcome to the second part of Lecture 5. I left off Part 1 with Ida B. Wells and a general nod to Black activism in the wake of the Civil War. Last time, I focused largely on politics, but aside from President Andrew Johnson and radical Republicans as a group in Congress, I didn't really talk about politicians as individuals. I want to briefly point out here that early on after the Civil War, Black men ran for and were elected to government positions. These men on the slide, whom you see here, were all members of the U.S. Congress. This image is from the Library of Congress and is also featured in the YAW Reconstruction chapter. I encourage you to follow up at least in YAW to get a more complete picture of the human connections between federal politics and the realities of life in the South over the course of Reconstruction. Talking about legal processes as well as violence on the part of white Southerners matters. Because the less power we have and the more danger we face, the greater the constraints on the choices that we are able to make in life. But constraints do not erase folks. Humans get on with managing their lives and navigating the environment. And as they do so, people, ordinary people, marginalized people, shape history. History is neither all top down nor all bottom up. But the complicated web of people living in an environment partially created by others while shaping the environment and historical context for everyone else themselves. I am not going to divide section four of lecture five here into hard sections because doing so would artificially separate matters that were inextricably intertwined. But I am going to move generally from family to labor to voting when discussing life under Jim Crow. Part of the strategy of enslavement was to try to dehumanize the people enslaved as much as possible. White Southerners maintained and doubled down on this tactic after the 13th Amendment ended legal slavery. We saw that briefly with the KKK and Black Codes in Part 1, but many efforts were much more insidious, and the combination resulted in a world that limited and shaped the lives of Black people but did not, in fact, render them anything other than people dealing with often horrible situations. Under slavery, while unions between enslaved people were welcomed because they often resulted in children who were viewed as property by the white people who held them, marriages between enslaved people were not legally recognized. Enslavers could and did sell family members away from one another for many reasons, starting with intentional cruelty and extending to the payment of debts on the part of the person doing the selling. Narratives written by people who had been enslaved are filled with the heartache of that reality. For example, taken from incidents in the life of a slave girl whom you saw when we discussed primary sources, on one of these sale days, I saw a mother lead seven children to the auction block. She knew that some of them would be taken from her, but they took all. The children were sold to a slave trader, and their mother was bought by a man in her own town. Before night, her children were all far away. She begged the trader to tell her where he intended to take them. This he refused to do. How could he when he knew that he would sell them one by one wherever he could command the highest price. I met that mother in the street and her wild, haggard face lives today in my mind. She wrung her hands in anguish and exclaimed, gone, all gone, why don't God kill me? I had no words wherewith to comfort her. Instances of this kind are of daily, yea, of hourly incurrence. That was written in 1861, right at the beginning of the American Civil War. As soon as they could after the end of the Civil War, Black people began to search for family members from whom they had been separated by enslavers. In many cases, people traveled to neighboring regions to look for family members in person. But it was also not unusual to place advertisements in newspapers, particularly those run by Black people. 
These are just a few examples. You can find many online and through ProQuest newspapers on the UC Davis Library website. I'm going to read these just in case you cannot see them clearly. Information wanted of my son, Jetson, who was sold about 16 years ago by a Mr. Dolheit of Oxford, Mississippi, to a Mr. Thomas Ford of the same place. I have not heard from him since. Information may be sent to his mother, Susan Huddleston, Box 178, Murfreesboro, Tennessee. Information wanted. My father, Phil Gibbons, left Owensboro, Kentucky 10 years ago from Missouri. Also my sister, Biddy Gibbons. It is said that she lived in Jackson, Missouri. Any information about them will be gladly received by writing to me at Owensboro, Kentucky, Jane Gibbons. Information wanted. Evans Green desires to find his mother, Mrs. Phyllis Green, whom he left in Virginia some years ago. She belonged to old Squire Cook of Winchester, whose son was an attorney at law. Any information respecting her will be thankfully received. Address this paper, Winchester paper, please copy. Information wanted of my son, Alan Jones. He left me before the war in Mississippi. He wrote me a letter in 1853, in which letter he said that he was sold to the highest bidder, a gentleman in Charleston, South Carolina. Nancy Jones, his mother, would like to know the whereabouts of the above-named person. Any information may be sent to Reverend J.W. Turner, pastor of AIM Church, Ottawa, Kansas. Early after the American Civil War, it was somewhat easier for Black people to move around the South. But as Black coasts took effect, they made it extremely difficult for Black people to travel even relatively short distances. Many Black Southerners were forced into supposedly contractual, free, in quotes, labor to exactly the same white people who had claimed ownership of them before the war. In your readings for this module, I've given you introductions to four historical monographs. Introductions like these have great basic information going beyond what I can present to you in class and also give you a chance to think about the arguments historians are making, the kinds of topics that they engage with, and how they go about making their points. I strongly encourage you to look at Savolia Glimpse intro to Out of the House of Bondage. Glimp here destroys the myth that there was a private domestic sphere unrelated to labor. To accept the white middle-class ideal of the gentle, nurturing woman staying in the house as reality is to accept 19th century propaganda that defined all women other than middle-class, white, heterosexual, or at least heterosexual behaving women as not actually women. I feel strongly about this because it still poisons conversations now by effectively obliterating women, especially Black women, who worked for wages outside their own home or who brought paid employment of necessity into their homes from the very beginning of the period covered in this class. As much as possible in each situation, Black people resisted the efforts of white Southerners to limit and rule their lives. One example of this is Black women who took jobs doing domestic labor in white households. White women who ran these households very much wanted their domestic labor to live in. This gave the employer constant opportunity to watch and try to control every movement of their Black employee's life and to make constant demands on them. Living in also separated Black women from their own families and children for extended periods in an intentional effort to make the employed woman's duty seem to be greater to the household where she worked than to her own family. Black women in these situations would commute long distances rather than live in. In the mid-19th century, a shift was happening in how self-empowerment was conceived by the dominant culture of the United States. You may remember that in the early republic, people had to own property to vote. Ownership of land equated to independence in both the North and the South. 
by the time period at the beginning of this class, this situation was rapidly changing in industrial regions where factory laborers and even middle managers did not own land. But this was happening much more rapidly in the Northeast and Great Lakes regions than in the South. For Black people in the South, freedom meant having land of their own to farm, just as it did for poor whites. One of the most egregious actions of the mainly white U.S. federal government was to return large plantations to their former owners, rather than dividing them up among freed people. Black people in the South were often left in the position of what is called sharecropping. In sharecropping, the person, or generally family, working the land paid for the supposed privilege by giving the legal owner of the land, who did no work on it, part of their crops, hence the sharecropping or literally sharing crops. This was particularly difficult in years when crops failed through no fault of the farmer. Landowners generally kept sharecroppers confined by the combination of black codes and insurmountable debt. I am going to add here that white Southerners as a group went out of their way to create a stereotype of black people as lazy. This still affects political discourse now, and we'll see it in this class in the 1960s through 80s in particular, on things like social safety net programs. This shows you the power of stereotype when it could convince so many that the people doing the most and the most demanding work were somehow lazy. Part of the rationalization given for not dividing plantations was that keeping them intact would return Southern farming to efficiency and production levels from before the Civil War. The fact that small farms were not of concern in New England and in the homesteading legislation encouraging white people to move west indicates that this excuse was not entirely on the up and up. We saw in the first part of the lecture that white politicians who had been part of the Confederate government were often able to return to powerful positions in the U.S. government, and this was certainly an important point. In the early Republic, land ownership had been the basic definition of independence. The idea was that if you work for wages, you were not able to act independently. You would, of necessity, represent the requirements of your employer in order to stay employed because you were literally dependent on them. As the U.S. industrialized, more and more white men worked for wages. While the dignity of factory employees was not a first consideration to politicians, the professionals of the growing white middle class also worked for money rather than directly producing foods or goods necessary for producing food and owning land. The ability to control one's own labor replaced the ownership of land as the defining feature of what was now freedom rather than independence. I'm going to repeat that because it's easy to just let it slip over you. But this is something that actually matters because people will argue about liberty and freedom meaning different things. So the ability to control one's own labor replaced the ownership of land as the defining feature of what was now freedom rather than independence. Another book introduction that I have given you in Module B is Amy Drew Stanley's From Bondage to Contract. This is also a reading that I suggest you at least get. At the heart of the new social views of the industrial economy was the supposed freedom of contract. We will look at this more when we look at the urban industrial regions of the U.S., but Stanley draws attention to the way that contracting labor worked to redefine freedom for formerly enslaved people in a way that did not require land while also placing them in a very unequal position when it came to negotiating contracts. This is a fame, this that you are looking at on the slide is a famous print published in Harper's Weekly in 1867. It shows a group of black men voting, possibly for the first time. The men are identified by type of occupation. The first is an artisan, symbolized by the hammer and the chisel in his pocket, followed by a businessman with a bank book. 
a soldier with metal, and probably a farmer at the back there. You might want to go back and reread parts of the Black Codes that I included in part one of this lecture that deal with the occupations prohibited to Black people at the state level. Here, if you look at the actual method of voting, you will see that there was no such thing as a secret ballot in the mid-19th century. You had a token, which you put into one or the other of containers, while everyone, including potentially your employers, watched you. Both before and after the 15th Amendment, which supposedly gave Black men the right to vote, white people in the South sought not only to intimidate Black voters into casting their votes a certain way, they sought to suppress the Black vote entirely. Poll taxes charged voters money for the right to vote. For those with power, the fact that poll taxes also kept poor white men from voting was of no real concern. Nevertheless, where those controlling voting wanted the poor white vote, they could use literacy tests to keep Black men from voting. This was not because Black men could not read, but because of the way the test was structured. It was not the same text for everyone. These are two extracts on the slide here of the Alabama State Constitution of 1865. The potential voter would be asked to read an extract aloud and to explain it. At their first pause on an unfamiliar word or strange phrasing, they would be disqualified from voting. White voters were given something like Section 5 above here, that every citizen may speak freely, write, and publish his sentiments on all subjects, being responsible for the abuse of that liberty. Fairly straightforward, not too much legalese. Black voters would be given something like Section 36. This enumeration of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people, and to guard against any encroachment on the rights hereby retained or any transgression of any of the high powers by this Constitution delegated. We declare that everything in this article is accepted out of the general powers of government and shall forever remain inviolate, and that all contrary thereto or to the following provisions shall be void. It's not just that it's longer, but that the wording is completely in legal government speak, totally unnatural to ordinary people. There were more methods of voter suppression along similar lines, and of course, when all else failed, there were paramilitary groups and terrorist tactics used on Black people who intended to vote. This is where I want to tell an encouraging story, because Black people did everything in their power, and beyond sometimes. They got college degrees, and when white colleges wouldn't admit them, they started the historically Black college and university system. Like any other group of people at the time, there were doctors, lawyers, and people just making a living. In other words, these were people acting like people. But I have to balance that perseverance with the reality of what happened to middle-class Black homes or to entire neighborhoods. This home has been burned, and the people who did it are posing proudly in front. This was not just during Reconstruction. We will see it happen over and over and over again through the 20th century. It is fairly traditional in American history classes to head back to the higher realm of politics and discuss the failure or death of Reconstruction. Considering what was happening on the ground, the 1877 election and the deal that politicians North and South made that ended Reconstruction is not any great surprise. As you know from part one of this lecture, throughout Reconstruction, federal troops had occupied the states of the former Confederacy to ensure compliance with laws and regulations governing southern states' re-entry into the Union. Though the protection these troops provided to African Americans was often minimal, it had been better than nothing. Once he assumed the presidency, Rutherford B. Hayes ended Reconstruction in 1877 and pulled the U.S. troops out of the South. This removed even the most negligible disincentive for the white ruling class of the South, who terrorized and oppressed freed Black people without any interference from the U.S. Army or anyone else. 
You can read more detail about the context around the end of Reconstruction in the YAWP chapter on Reconstruction. I've also given you in the Module B reading the introduction to this aptly named book, The Death of Reconstruction, by Heather Cox Richardson. This piece reviews the standard explanations for the demise of Reconstruction and adds on to them. It also provides a picture of the interconnectedness and disconnectedness of developments in the North and South that will fill out what you get from me in lectures. Key points for Lecture 5. The period between the end of the American Civil War and the election of 1877 in the South is called Reconstruction. What was being reconstructed was the U.S. as a unified nation. The infrastructure of the South was being rebuilt. Don't confuse these. In the late 1860s and on through the 19th century, the political parties were quite different than we think of them currently. The Republicans were mainly white Americans born in the U.S. and living in the Northeast, plus Black Americans. Overall, this party was anti-enslavement and also often pro-tariff. The Democrats were mainly white Americans born in the U.S. and living in the South, and some European immigrants in the Northeast. Overall, this party was fine with enslavement of other people, and also often anti-tariff. One group within the Republican Party, the so-called Radical Republicans, were most committed to ensuring full civil rights for formerly enslaved people and to transforming the society and economy of the South. The radical Republicans did not get what they wanted. They did succeed in pushing some legislation through, including the Reconstruction Amendments, but they mainly ended up acting defensively. President Lincoln was a Republican, hence the party of Lincoln, but his Reconstruction plan centered on readmitting former Confederate states to the U.S. and not on ensuring civil rights for Black Americans. Andrew Johnson, Lincoln's vice president, became president when Lincoln was assassinated. Johnson was a Democrat from the South and avowedly racist. His Reconstruction plan was the most lenient toward former Confederates and provided the least, like none, protection for Black Southerners. Under President Johnson, most high-level Confederate politicians returned to the U.S. Congress during or after Reconstruction, and white Southerners both began a terrorist campaign against Black Americans the KKK was one, probably the best known part of this, and white Southerners passed legislation called Black Codes that severely limited the lives of Black Southerners. Against major resistance from Johnson and white Southerners, radical Republicans in Congress passed legislation to try to counter the serious erosion of civil rights of Black Americans. This included the Civil Rights Act of 1866, the Reconstruction Acts of 1867-68, and the Reconstruction Amendments, 13th, 14th, and 15th, to the U.S. Constitution. The 13th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution ended legal slavery. The 14th Amendment includes birthright citizenship and the Equal Protections Clause. The 15th Amendment made it illegal for states to deny their citizens the right to vote as long as those citizens were male. White Southerners found ways to work around these amendments and continued to bar Black Americans from exercising their right to vote. Emancipated Black Southerners tried to create a life as different from enslavement as they could, given the constraints placed on them by paramilitary violence and Black codes. The private domestic sphere is 19th century middle-class propaganda. Very few women could actually afford to stay in the home. Black women after the Civil War often worked in the domestic space of white families or brought paid work like laundry home into their own domestic space. 
Many Black Southerners continued to vote at great risk to themselves and to their families. Black activists like Ida B. Wells were forced to spread their energies across many fights for justice, not the least of these opposing the frequent murder, lynching, of Black Southerners, especially but not only men by white Southerners. The coda for this lecture is on exodusters, freed African Americans who migrated from the South to Kansas after it became clear that Reconstruction was not going to offer them freedom in meaningful terms. The Library of Congress has collections related to the exodusters, which they have made available online. You will need primary sources for your term project stage C. Some of you might be interested in using material that you can find here. I've included the website, but you can also just Google Library of Congress exodusters. They have a fair amount of tertiary information to get you oriented, and they also have quite a variety of primary sources. The U.S. National Archives also has primary source material on exodusters that may be of interest to you. This is a good opportunity to just poke around and look at the different types of primary sources that historians use. I discussed the failure or death of Reconstruction in both parts of Lecture 5. In the immediate aftermath of the American Civil War, Freed Black Americans were able to purchase land, organize schools, and participate in civic life. These freedoms were short-lived, as organizations such as the KKK and the White League of Louisiana began campaigns of violence and other acts of intimidation to prevent people from voting and from settling where they wish. The tenant-style farming of sharecropping that I talked about in the main lecture tied employees to the white landowner when coupled with predatory lending practices directed at freed persons, many Black Americans in the South pointed out that the situation was not greatly different to that of enslavement. Thousands of Black Americans migrated from the South, especially to Kansas. They called themselves exodusters. Kansas was a practical choice. It is much closer to the South than far-off spots like California and Oregon. For those coming from many parts of the South, a boat or train ride to St. Louis, Missouri, I'll find it there, I used to live there, was the beginning of their journey to Kansas. While conditions on these boats and trains were generally challenging, riding in any form was certainly preferable to walking. Many arrived in St. Louis with few resources and little idea of how they would get across Missouri to Kansas. I will point out that Oklahoma here, now the state of Oklahoma, was at the time called Indian Territory, and it's where people had been made to walk, Native American people had been made to walk from the southern states like Georgia. The exploits of anti-slavery activists like John Brown, whom you see on the left here, made Kansas appealing to Black Americans leaving the South. I mentioned leading Kansas very briefly in our live lecture discussion, and a few of you included it in your quiz answers on the legislative branch. John Brown is legendary, and you can find more on him, including a song sung by federal soldiers during the Civil War. But the short story is that he was a white man who fought and died for the cause of abolition. He didn't just talk about it. Many of the African Americans who migrated to Kansas early on, before the 1879 exodus properly began, came from Tennessee. There, a popular movement took shape in 1874, leading to a so-named Colored People's Convention in Nashville in 1875. That's a good 10 years after the Civil War, two years before the official end of Reconstruction. Many town promoters, most famously Benjamin Singleton, whom you see on the right there, saw this convention as a way to convince Black people to migrate to Kansas. The convention resulted in the designation of a board of commissioners to officially promote migration to Kansas. Promoters like Singleton became known as conductors and began leading African-American families to Kansas. 
The handbill in the center was printed by Singleton. It says, Ho for Kansas, brethren, friends, and fellow citizens. Think about that right there and what it meant. I feel thankful to inform you that the Real Estate and Homestead Association will leave here the 15th of April, 1878, in pursuit of homes in the southwestern lands of America at transportation rates cheaper than ever was known before. For full information, inquire of Benjamin Singleton, better known as Old Pap, North 5th, number 5, North Front Street. And then in fine print here, pay attention to this. Beware of speculators and adventurers, as it is a dangerous thing to fall into their hands. Singleton, a former slave born in Nashville, Tennessee, became the acknowledged leader of the Exodusta movement in 1879, two years after the end of Reconstruction. In the late 1860s, Singleton and his associates had urged Black people to acquire farmland in Tennessee, but white speculators would not sell productive land to them. We will talk about land speculation and the Homestead Act in a later lecture. So for now, just note land speculation in the back of your mind. As an alternative to Tennessee, Singleton began scouting land in Kansas in the early 1870s. In 1873, he led a group of 300 Southern Black Americans to settle in Cherokee County, Kansas, founding what became known as Singleton's Colony. By 1874, Singleton and his associates had formed the Edgefield Real Estate and Homestead Association in Tennessee, which steered more than 20,000 Black migrants to Kansas between 1877 and 1879. This is an early example of Photoshop for you. Of course, there was no Photoshop. This is a photograph of a crowded steamboat and the migration organizers, Benjamin Singleton and S.A. McClure, have been cut out of another photograph and pasted into the foreground. The majority of exodusters settled in Kansas, but many moved on to what would become Oklahoma, Colorado, Ohio, Nebraska, North Dakota, South Dakota, New Mexico, Arizona, and Montana. I encourage you to go to the sites I recommended at the beginning of this coda, National Archives and Library of Congress, to look at maps, land deeds, letters, petitions, and more associated with the exodusters. I am going to present just one more story here. And this is rather wonderfully one of the few photographs that we have of a group of exodusters in front of their home. Many exodusters settled in Leavenworth, Kansas, where the proliferation of photo studios in the 1870s allowed the exodusters and other Black Americans in the community to create a visual record of their new community. The photographer studios lasted through the early 1900s, but as Leavenworth's photographers retired, their negatives were often discarded. In the 1920s, a photographer named Mary Everhard moved to Leavenworth. She began purchasing photographers' archives as they shuttered their studios. Over time, she amassed a collection of 40,000 negatives depicting Leavenworth's early history and saving those negatives from destruction. In 1967, a collector from Chicago purchased the negatives, selling them off in batches to various museums, including the Ammon Carter Museum of American Art in Fort Worth, Texas. If you want to see all of the photographs, you have to request in-person visits to the Ammon Carter Museum to view the archives, and you can do that. But I also found some of their pictures published online, and I have included those in the rest of the coda. Here you see James Turner around 1895 in an image taken by an unknown photographer. And on the right, Private Hall Schrader of Ottawa, Kansas, with three soldiers from the 23rd Volunteer Infantry around 1895 to 1899 by Harrison Putney. And I didn't point out Private Hall Schrader because it doesn't tell us which one he is. This is a photograph of Alice Davis, and we know that because it says so on the reverse of the photograph. 
The museum gives a date of around 1870s to 1900s, but the dress clearly dates the image to the early 1900s. The example of the dress on the left is dated by the Met as 1900 to 1905. This is one way you can date things. This photograph shows the H. Hopkins children. And you might note this hat here. It's just worn as a hat, but it did have associations with education. You might consider what that meant. And here you have Thomas Meadows in 1890, taken by an unknown photographer. And probably this is his wife, although it doesn't say so. I don't know what she is holding in her hand here. It might be a bag. It might be something else. This is Kelly Boy in 1893 on the left. Notice he's young enough that he's still wearing a skirt, and he's small enough that the dog with him is probably about the same weight as he is. And this is William Jordan with a tricycle in 1896. Both of these photos are by Horace Stevenson. The tricycle is interesting. It, we often associate tricycles now with children's toys, but this looks far more like it is just a mode of transportation. Here we have Mrs. Johnson in 1897 and Abraham Logan on the right by an unknown photographer. And notice his watch chain. This is a sign of class and sophistication. And also he is holding an umbrella. The photograph on the left is identified as Mrs. Peyton and mother, and it is by an unknown photographer. In this case, we know the photograph was taken by Harrison Putney, but we don't know who the woman is. Both of these are 1910. Finally, our backdrop for this lecture has been a detail from a rather elaborate gown from the 1870s. I've used it because doing laundry, a job generally taken by Black women in the South, is usually considered unskilled labor. I want you to imagine cleaning this dress using soap made of lye with no machine of any kind, only a washboard and scrub brush, and doing that without damaging the very delicate fabric, the lace, or the ribbon. I call that skilled labor.